Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for coming to my talk today. Uh, it's titled Data Science and Cloud Native Development is Awesome. Great, so just to kick things off, my name is Michael Clifford. I'm a data scientist and a manager and uh, a project lead uh, with the office of the CTO at Red Hat. Uh, I'm primarily focusing on applying machine learning to, I, uh, to problems in, in like the IT domain, as well as developing some best practices around cloud native ML ops. Uh, also interested in kind of like what tools and structures we can put in place to help support teams of data scientists work together uh, more effectively in this, this kind of environment. So uh, great, if you have any questions or want to connect with uh, me, um, you can reach me on my email here or even better on, on GitHub. So cool. So today is going to be about what is, I guess, like in my opinion, uh, the benefits of embracing a cloud native approach to your data science workflow and infrastructure and some of the open source tools that are available to support this, this kind of workflow. So uh, by the end of this talk, you should hopefully know some more about uh, cloud native data science and be set up to get going with some um, data science yourself uh, in the cloud if, if you want to. Great, so let's just jump right into it. So before we talk about cloud native data science, let's just get really clear on what we mean when we say data science and, and what is the data science workflow. So I'm not gonna go through this chart in detail. I hope most of you have seen something very uh, similar before, but just to get started, um, I thought it'd be good to just kind of ground everyone in this kind of loosely agreed upon data science workflow. So uh, we start with some high level business problem that we need to formulate into an engineering problem with some clear and quantitative success metrics like uh, as best we can. We then move on to data collection and exploration. Um, we will go look at uh, doing some feature engineering, then model training, uh, validation, deployment, and monitoring. Uh, and then there, of course, are a couple of sections where we might need to kind of loop back to the previous step, given the results of, of a later step. And this is just kind of the iterative nature of data science development. So uh, what I hope you all see here is that kind of in my opinion, this is the responsibility of a single data scientist or a small team of data scientists to build the ML service all the way from problem definition to data wrangling, to model training, uh, serving and monitoring. So some other diagrams I, I've seen might kind of divide this into three separate roles. The first being a data engineer, the middle being a data scientist, and the end uh, an application engineer. Uh, however, the kind of the overhead and developmental friction that can be incurred from three separate roles involved here um, is something that I think can be um, avoided. Uh, but how, right? Uh, there's obviously a lot of special skills and specializations needed at each stage that merit uh, individual specialists. So what can be done to kind of empower a data scientist to own a project from inception to deployment? Well, I think it really comes down to having the right tools and infrastructure in place to support a team of data scientists. So what does that look like? Well, uh, it kind of sort of looks like this graph here. Um, so this is an example of how we address this, this problem on, on our team. So we wrap the whole workflow into the cloud and support it with a suite of cloud native data science tools. So you might be telling yourself, well, that's great, but like clouds are expensive and complicated and I don't know how to set one up. Um, or operate my own, own cloud infrastructure, nor do I have any interest in doing that. Uh, well, that's actually fine because the Operate First uh, project, which is an initiative um, that I'm uh, involved with, is provides a free and open cloud environment to anyone, like including everyone here, uh, to use. So there's currently an existing community hybrid cloud with clusters 
uh, that exist in, in the US. We have some in Germany as well as some uh, on AWS. And we're working on extending this community cloud even further. Um, so this is all managed through our Operate First organization um, publicly on, on GitHub. So there's also like, uh, so not only is this currently running, there's also an associated community of data scientists that work on open source projects uh, together within, within this environment. Um, cool, so what do these clusters do, right? They run uh, OpenShift, um, and on them we use GitOps, best practices, in public repos to, to manage everything. We generate operational data that we can make public uh, as well. But for the purposes of this talk, the, the thing to note is that we run applications on top on top of everything and the main app and the main kind of application we are currently operating is the open data hub or odh and i'll talk about that in a minute but the main takeaway i want you all to have from this slide is that there is a cloud already set up and waiting for you and at the end of this talk i'll go through a demo to how to actually get up and running so what is Open Data Hub, right? Uh, the Open Data Hub is a project that we refer to as a, as a meta project. What it does is integrate some open source tools to provide an end-to-end -end machine learning platform on top of OpenShift or Kubernetes. Uh, it's often referred to as like a meta project that's aimed at integrating multiple open source projects into one project um, that can be easily deployed by users. So this particular meta project comprises things like Selden, Elira, Kafka, Spark, uh, Grafana, and Prometheus, as well as Kubeflow, among others. I mean, it's still, it's an evolving project. And all these things are kind of taken together to provide a, like I said, a, a comprehensive end-to-end -end machine learning development platform. So when we say we're running Data Hub, it really means that we're running all these services for data scientists. So, uh, Data Hub is like a huge project in and of itself, and you're interested in, in getting more involved there, I encourage you to go to their, their website. Um, cool, so as a data scientist, right, the Open Data Hub uh, service that is operated by the Operate First Cloud represents our main uh, toolkit for doing cloud native data science development. But why bother with any of this stuff, right? Like, why don't we just why don't I just use my my local machine? Um, well, many reasons, right? So, as a, as a data scientist, there are a few items that are important uh, for me if I'm really going to be able to own my model from inception to inference and, and deployment. And like, what are these things? So, there's compute resources I need to do my work. Uh, not everything can or should be run on my local machine. I need a solid way of collaborating with other data scientists um, to share notebooks and reproducible content. I need a way of creating this reproducible content reliably um, and ensuring that experiments and environments are kind of always the same. Um, I need an easy path for me to actually get my models out into the world. Uh, like with simple deployments and inference models, or excuse me, simple deployments of my inference models, um, and ways to quickly and easily build like uh, interactive dashboards uh, to share results uh, with, with stakeholders. So obviously this is not a, a complete comprehensive list, but I think it does a pretty good job of just kind of covering some of those major touch points needed to complete the data science workflow. So are these things met by taking a cloud native approach? Uh, well, I, I certainly think so, right? Especially if uh, you're using a tool like Open Data Hub uh, that provides us with Jupyter Hub, which gives uh, an elastic compute uh, environment with a data science friendly IDE where you can develop your work and run experiments. Uh, we also here use GitHub as a place to share our work and collaborate. Um, but beyond that, it also we kind of employ a particular tool called the AICOECI, which was developed by our team, but can be integrated into really any GitHub uh, repository that does continuous integration and delivery based on uh, Tecton pipelines. These tools also help us build custom 
uh, images so that we can publish and share reproducible experiments and other content just by making uh, GitHub releases. Uh, we can also use tools like Elira and Kubeflow to construct modular pipelines and machine learning workflows directly from our note or directly with our notebooks. We can also use tools like Selden um, for simple application deployment and model serving. And finally, we can use things like Trino and Superset uh, to share interactive uh, data content. So cool, so as you can see from this list, right, if you want to drive data science development from inception to deployment, there are a lot of cloud native tools available that really support this. Awesome, so th that was like really a uh, quick and pretty high level introduction to the benefits of embracing a cloud native data science approach and some of the tools and resources that, uh, that are actually um, available now if you want to get involved. Um, but there, there's a lot of content and detailed tutorials around each of these tools and topics uh, that you can find here at GitHub uh, AICOE AIOps data science uh, workflows if you're interested in digging a little bit deeper. So cool. So now that I've hopefully piqued your interest in cloud native data science, let me show you how to uh, actually access the Operate First Community Cloud and get started. Uh, cool. So how are we going to do that? Um, let's do uh, a demo. So I'm going to do a demo here and all of you should be able to follow along uh, without much issue. Um, this demo is not going to go all the way through the process up to uh, model serving, just simply for uh, ease of demo and time constraints. Um, but if you are interested in that, like I said, go into the Workflows GitHub repository or even on the operatefirst.cloud. Um, you can find more content and demos that will walk you through all of that stuff. So cool, so let's get started. So the first thing we're all gonna do is go to operate-first.cloud. So get out of here, we'll go here. So great, so this is a kind of our main space on the web if you're interested in learning more about the project um, in general, even the, the, kind of the cloud management side of things or the data science side of things, this is the place to come. Particularly if you're interested in data science, you can come here. Like I said, the, the data science workflow uh, content also exists here, so you're able to, to take a look at that. Um, but today we are interested in initially accessing Jupyter Hub. So how do we go about doing that? Uh, let's go to the community handbook. Let's go to GitOps docs documentation, and this will take us to a Jupyter book that has uh, a lot of information about how the operate first environment is managed. And then we can come here to the open data hub section, which is obviously the service that we've been, been talking about for uh, during this presentation. Then we can see the currently deployed components, or at least some of them here. So the main tool that, by which we kind of like interact with the operate first environment and do our development work is through uh, Jupyter Hub. So let's go here and great. So this will ask us to log in. If you have a Google uh, account or a GitHub account, both of those should be uh, able to be used for authentication here. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and select operate first to log in. <clears throat> So uh, what you're seeing here is the Jupyter Hub spawner page. Um, I am assuming most people here are familiar with like Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Lab, um, but you might not be familiar with Jupyter Hub. Um, essentially, Jupyter Hub is like an OpenShift um, and uh, Kubernetes tool for uh, deploying Jupyter servers for users on top of um, the cloud infrastructure. So. The first thing you need to do when you're spinning up uh, your, your Jupyter server is select the notebook image that you want to use. So our team kind of uh, develops and maintains two different types of uh, images. So there's one that we refer to as like a content image. 
which is something like uh, audio decoder demo notebook image. Um, so this essentially is an image that there's a, a GitHub repo um, that has all of the requirements for building the image, as well as all the content um, that's like notebooks and data or ways to access the data, um, all of that kind of packaged together. And when you run this image, um, it will come with all that stuff ready to go. So without error, you should be able to run all of the notebooks, get access to the data, and actually interact with this audio decoder demo um, without issue. Um, so since it contains content, we refer to it as a content image, and that really makes, that's one of the ways in which we effectively kind of share our content uh, with others, uh, make it reproducible, and, and so on. So that's one type of image. The other type of image that we work with is the um, uh, just like a development image. So that's something like Elira Notebooks, uh, Minimal Python, or Minimal Python with, with PyTorch. So essentially, these don't come with any content um, on board. It's just a like well-defined uh, stack of uh, packages, essentially. Um, that we want to work on. So every time we spin up a new image, every time I spin up the Elira notebook image, I know I'm starting from the same base. So again, that makes it really easy to ensure that I um, am kind of working in the same development environment when another colleague spins up another Elira notebook image and starts working, they're also starting from the same base. Um, so that's really useful. Cool. So today, because it's probably most interesting. Um, let's go ahead and spin up a content image for you to uh, take a look at. So we'll look at the OpenShift CI analysis notebook image. Um, this is going to have some information or some content from a particular project uh, that we're working on. I won't get too into the details, but it's loosely focused on um, using uh, some openly available CI data. Uh, that's of, of based on the operate first uh, development and doing some analysis on it. So let's go ahead and we'll select that. Um, the other thing that we want to do, because it's like a kind of a shared compute environment, is that we want to uh, define the size of the pod that we're actually going to spin up, right? So uh, maybe I'm just doing some like code reviews. I don't actually need too much resources. I can pick a small. Uh, maybe I actually need to do some model training, pick a large instance for whatever the time is, um, whatever, the, whatever I need to do. So I can go ahead and, and do that. And then finally, there's the choice of selecting environment variables. So if I'm going to interact with S3 or um, some other remote storage um, and I don't want to put my credentials directly into my notebook or get them somehow accidentally uploaded to GitHub. Um, you can add them here so they get injected into your uh, pod as, as environment variables. So let's go ahead and start our server. So the main thing to note is this is spinning up is that it is um, basically starting from scratch, build, uh, uh, deploying the image that I selected, but then it's also connecting to something called a persistent volume claim, which is kind of like your own little personal drive on um, in, uh, in the cluster, basically. Um, so anytime you spin up a Jupyter Hub server, it will always connect to your PVC. So even though the server is like ephemeral and starts from scratch each time, um, any work that you do, like any code you write or data you generate or anything like that um, will actually persist between sessions. Great, so now that our pod has spun up, it deploys us into a JupyterLab environment. Um, so I'm hoping that this looks pretty familiar to everyone uh, here. So now that this is up, I can basically uh, interact with it in the way that I would you know, on my local machine or in any other way. So I can deploy a notebook, um, consoles. We This particular image uses Elira, which is one of the tools I talked about earlier, which can be used for generating uh, pipelines. So we can take our notebooks and kind of string them together in an acyclical graph and generate little, little pipelines from them, um, which is a very useful tool. Um, I can also spin up a, a terminal. 
Great, so here's also all the data that I am using. This is my PVC, all the projects that I'm working on are, are here. Um, and we can see oh, from two minutes ago, uh, when we initially spun up the pod, that we actually got the, the content that we're interested in. So now we have this OCP CI analysis um, repository that we want to take a look at. And so one thing that you'll see here is that it's got a lot of <laughs> folders and files and things, uh, but the main thing to notice is that we use a project template uh, in our group so that we always have, so we as we move between projects, we know where the notebooks are supposed to be, where the data is and all of that. So that's something that you can find in our, um, on our repositories as well that makes things re really easy. Um, it also comes with some particular um, configuration files that we use for our CI um, and, and, and other things. So if we use pre-commit or prow, any of those things, they're all configured and set up through this, um, th through this, this template. Uh, cool. So we also use use pip file as our main way of, of managing the, the dependencies. And so we're not going to have to, if we didn't use a content image, we would have to run uh, some some way of installing all these these pip files using either pipenv or Thamos, which is a environment management tool that our team developed. Um, but we don't have to do that because it should all work. So now let's see what we have here. Let's go to notebooks. Let's go to data sources and go to test grid and test grid EDA. So now we can go ahead and start to look at a particular notebook. Uh, great. So again, not going to go into the particulars here, but assuming everything worked, we should be able to just click run and ev everything here will work. So let's go ahead and restart the kernel and run all the cells. So this should oh, just work. Seems like it is. So it's going to go ahead and run, hopefully successfully. Great, let's see. Great, and we went ahead and Looks like it's downloading some data, which will be as expected. And cool, so we know that that worked. So let's just go ahead and stop that. Don't need any more data being downloaded. Um, but cool, so let's say I wanna make a change or I just wanna see the changes that have been made um, to the data, right? So, um, great. So one of the kind of difficult uh, sticking points with, uh, notebooks, right, is that they don't actually, um, like you can't look at a diff the same way as, as like a Python file. Um, it has to do with the fact that the notebooks are actually kind of rendered and what their, their raw output is something like this. So a lot of things can change, like the execute time or cell count or whatever that really don't have anything to do with, with the development. So um, if you want to see what actually changed, there's there's a way to do that. Um, another thing to think about with notebooks is the code might not change that much, but maybe the underlying data changes, and so the outputs are changing. So you can be make a very small change um, to the code, like picking a different data set, which wouldn't necessarily seem substantial, but then the outputs can can change dramatically. So if I want to do a code review or collaborate with with a colleague, how would I go about doing that? Well, luckily we can use um, this Git tool as part of JupyterLab to see the differences between the head uh, and the changes that I just made. So here we can go through this and we can just see simply because time has moved forward, we have a slightly larger data set uh, to access, um, some of the outputs have changed and, and so on. So cool, so we can use this to to make some changes. So say we did make a change and we're interested in actually pushing it to GitHub and, and contributing it upstream. That's great. Um, and so at this point, there are basically two, two things that, that will happen. And I'll share those with you now. Uh, the first thing being that when you push your changes, um, and open up a PR, it will kick off this CI process. So I'm not going to push a change here because there's nothing really 
that needs to be changed. Um, but let me show you one that exists. So if you come to AICOE, AIOPS, OCP, CI analysis, which is where this is managed, you can look at the pull requests and see we have maybe reduced log classification service resource. And we have a pull request where Sashita, which is one of the bots that we use and part of the AI COE uh, CI process is here telling us that it's not approved for some reason. Um, and then we have a number of tests that get run, right? So we have both a, a build check and a pre-commit on this one at least. And the pre-commit is uh, running on, on Prowl. So we can go ahead and see the errors that, that occurred. So we can address that. Uh, we could also look at, whoops, the, um, could the build check, so it actually will run the code beforehand. These aren't saved indefinitely, but we can look at a pipeline run and look at a build request and kind of make sure everything built correctly. So this is really useful for us. So before the code gets merged in any way, um, these are automatically kicked off and it's checked before any human intervention. So that's really nice. So uh, what is the other thing that we can do at this point? So let's say I actually wanna share this with somebody um, in, in the world. What, what, how do I do that? So I can actually quickly um, build uh, an image and add it to that list of content images on um, Operate First. So if we come to Project Meteor, so shower.meteor.zone, this allows you to put in any GitHub repository and it will go ahead and kick off the, the build pipeline, um, build it as both um, a Jupyter book if it's configured correctly and a Jupyter Hub image that can then be deployed on um, our, our Jupyter Hub instance. So let me just show you an example. You can do a series CI analysis. You can pick, pick a particular branch and determine the components that you want to have deployed. Um, so cool. And so we have uh, a number of available meteors for us. Let's say that we're interested in the OCP CI analysis. We can go here, see one uh, rendered website with all the content. So this can just be used to, to share with, with folks. Um, and then we can also go to Jupyter Hub. So I'm not gonna click on that because it will just take me to Jupyter Hub because I'm already logged in. Uh, but ideally it will take you back to the spawner page where you'll be able to select the image, uh, Meteor KZ9KW, and it will act just like a content image. Cool, so um, that is mostly everything that I wanted to go over with everyone. Um, I hope that was helpful. Um, the idea here is that we, everyone should have been able to start from nothing, get some compute resources, access a Jupyter Hub, um, understand how to interact with a, a content image, um, know how to look at rich diffs in notebooks. And once a change that you're interested in making is made, you have the opportunity of the AI, um, the CI process and GitHub is um, automatically kicked off. Um, and if you want to share your content, it's very simple to build an image um, using the, the Meteor project. Uh, so cool. So I hope that was uh, interesting, <laughs> useful to people. Um, if you have any questions, um, I think now's the time. Thanks so much.